We have an outline for tonight, okay. October 25th. And so how we're going to begin each workshop is that we're going to start with a piece of writing, but we're, that's not going to be part of our, our night, except that it's just going to be read. You're going to take it home or not take it home and think about it or feel something about it. It's just to expose you to as many types of writing uh, at this beginning section. That may change after a time, but that's how we're going to do it. And we're not going to talk about what's read initially. We're just going to absorb it, hopefully. So tonight, um, we will take our reading from a poet um, whose name is Stanley Kunitz. Stanley Kunitz was um, a poet who graduated from Harvard. Um, and uh, after his postgrad work, 98% um, of the students who graduate from Harvard are given um, an internship immediately. Um, this, in my opinion, great man was denied his internship because he was Jewish. Yeah. And he carried that heavily all of his life. But the subject he writes about tonight is from his childhood, and this is called The Portrait. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself, especially at such an awkward time and in a public park that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping. When I came down from the attic with a pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with a brave mustache and deep brown level eyes, she ripped it into shreds without a single word. In my 64th year, I can feel my cheek burning. Oh, oh so... So we talked, in a lot of this is going to be taken from the talk that I gave. You were there, Charles, yeah. when I gave the talk, and we mentioned um, a couple of things. One is what I call the first page test. I think we talked about that, that when I pick up a book, I have to be convinced, usually. Uh, the exception to that is um, uh, the shipping news, which I don't know if any of you have read. I read the shipping news, and it took me actually 40 pages to enter the story. And I don't know what it was that made me stick with it, but it was well worth it. Yeah. The movie they made of it was one of the few movies that's really as the story goes, written in the book. But most of the time, I like to be, I think of it sometimes as a well you lean over, and suddenly you fall in and you can't get out. Um, and most of the time, my first page test has not let me down. So I'd like to start tonight with a couple readings uh, from my first page test. And we will talk about the first page. I'll read uh, from one book. We'll talk about it. And I'll read the first page of another book. We'll talk about it. So uh, first page tests. Probably a lot of you have read this book. The Glass Castle. It was also made into a movie. The movie was a little disappointing for me, although um, it was a wonderful movie. It's just that it didn't adhere to the power, I thought, of the book. It, um, I thought this was a nice touch in the book that the married couple, uh, her parents, this is Janice Wall, Jeanette Walls, uh, was put in the front of the book. I thought that was very 
clever and appealing. Um, so we're not actually going to start with the first page because this is a memoir. Mm. And the first page is actually, uh, um, I don't know if you're aware of the term, in medias res, have people here heard of that term? What was the term again? The term is medias res, and anyone who studied Latin, I don't know, mm -hmm. who has means in the middle of the action. So the first couple pages, we're not really in the memoir yet. She's just giving her present context. So uh, for myself, that was fine, but I wanted to start right into the memoir section and how I got pulled in. Again, the glass castle, bunch of net walls. I was on fire. It's my earliest memory. I was three years old, and we were living in a trailer park in southern Arizona town whose name I never knew. I was standing on a chair in front of the stove, wearing a pink dress my grandmother had bought me. Pink, my favorite color. The dress's skirt stuck out like a tutu. And I liked to spin around in front of the mirror, thinking I looked like a ballerina. But at that moment, I was wearing the dress to cook hot dogs. Let's just go back for a second. I was three years old. Then let's go back to that sentence. At that moment, I was wearing the dress to cook hot dogs, watching them swell and bob in the boiling water as the late morning sunlight filtered in through the trailer's small kitchenette window. I could hear Mom in the next room singing while she worked on one of her paintings. Juju, our black mutt, was watching me. I stabbed one of the hot dogs with a fork and bent over and offered it to him. The wiener was hot, so Juju licked at it tentatively. But when I stood up and started stirring the hot dogs again, I felt a blaze of heat on my right side. The wiener, oh, sorry. <clears throat> I turned to see where it was coming from and realized my dress was on fire. Frozen with fear, I watched the yellow-white flames make a ragged brown line up the pink fabric of my skirt and climb my stomach. Then the flames lip leapt up, reaching my face. I screamed. I smelled the burning and heard a horrible crackling as the fire singed my hair and the eyelashes. Juju was barking. So let's, let's first pause for just a second and say the two action words here. I screamed. Juju was barking. I screamed again. Mom ran into the room. Mommy! Helped me, I shrieked. I was still standing on the chair, swatting the fire with the fork I had been using to stir the hot dogs. Mom ran out of the room and came back with one of the army sur surplus blankets. I hated because the wool was so scratchy. Dad had gone off in the car 
So mom grabbed me and my younger brother, Brian, and hurried over to the trailer next to ours. The woman who lived there was hanging her laundry on the clothesline. She had the clothespins in her mouth. Mom, in an unnaturally calm voice, explained what had happened and asked if we could please have a ride to the hospital. The woman dropped her clothespins and laundry right there in the dirt without saying anything, ran for her car. So that's our first first page that hooked me in. And what I'd like to know is what stands out in that first page for you. What sticks with you? What doesn't? What do you have questions about? Well, the first line is, is a terrific first line. And I, I, I forget exactly what it was, but I, I realized I was on fire. I was on fire. Now, this is not the way a memoir usually begins. Because again, we're here in medias res, in the middle of the action. Normally in a memoir, we say long ago and far away when I was a child and such and such. So this is a very brave first line for a memoir. Mm -hmm. Someone who knows they're going to talk about their child. But it turns out as you read through the story that the entire book is built on this very first page. There are clues on the first page. Did anyone sense anything that isn't quite as it should be from the first page? No, I don't. Uh, I, what remember, strikes me is her, the dress. Her dress seems like, so what's the connection of the two to the standout dress? Uh, how close was it to a fire, to the stove? She was right in front of the stove, standing on a stool. At three years old. At three years old. So those are, your, those are the beginning of your clues. She's all dressed up in obviously something no one has noticed she's wearing. She's cooking at the stove as a three-year-old on a stool, which would make her skirt be directly in front of the fire. Mm. She can hear her mother in the back room singing, painting. There's something there that doesn't feel right, right mm. from the get-go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something that doesn't feel right. Yeah. Yeah. What no do you think it might be? I don't know. For me, it's a lack of super supervision. Exactly. Say that again. A lack of supervision. Yes. Yes. What some might call neglect. Mm -hmm. Now, she screamed. What happens? Nothing. The dog barks. What happens? Nothing. She screams again. There's one more clue to how this story will unfold. What kind of blanket does her mother bring in the room? <laughs> An army blanket. Rough. I grew up with them as a child because my uncles were in the war and we had them around the house. Yeah. So I know what a scratchy blanket. Mightn't the mother have chosen something, anything else? A rug, perhaps, a number of towels. Mm -hmm. She had a choice. Of course, you're very hysterical when something like that happens. But perhaps she had a choice, and she didn't make it. She just grabbed the first thing that popped into her mind. All Janet Wall's life, she lived with an entirely scarred body. Wow. All over her face, her back, 
her arms. Yeah. And she talks very little about that uh, throughout the book, but it sets the stage like nothing else could. Wow. That um, not only was she neglected as a child and raised in a terribly difficult family, but um, she had to live uh, with scarring, yeah. which takes its own terrible emotional toll. Does anybody have anything else they want to contribute about this first page? For example, I'm going to take a vote. Who reading this first page would become interested in the book? You. Yeah. How about you, Charles? Yes, I would. Yeah. How about you? I would. So, I so I'm not the only one here <laughs> who became interested from this first page. And I, I think I should, ironically, I'm sitting here. I gave, I bought that book brand new. I never read it. I took it to the library because I had it confused with another book. Had I read the first page, I would still have the book. I think there's I mean, a book called I, The Crystal something or other that many people have confused with this book, and I think that might be written by um, Mary Carr. She is the writer of, also a memoirist, uh, who has written a book called um, The Liar's Club. And anyone interested in writing memoir should definitely read one of the finest memoirs uh, that I have ever read by Mary Carr. Okay, we have one more beginning page. Um, at some point we will also be talking, and tonight in fact, we'll be talking about observation, and this first page has both, but for now we'll just stay with whether the first page test works. And I'm going to include the quote in here. I do not have a quote at the beginning of each of my chapters when I write. I have a quote at the beginning of my book that takes me forever to find so that it is, feels integrated to what I've written. Um, so not an easy thing to do. I can't imagine getting it for every single chapter. But she does, and uh, it's beautiful the way they intermingle. So I'll start with that even though it's not her work. The queen, for her part, is the unifying force of the community. If she is removed from the hive, the workers very quickly sense her absence. After a few hours or even less, they show unmistakable signs of queenlessness. Beautiful word that she just made up. I love made up words. I make them up too. Uh, most of my writing teachers along the path, and they've been many, have said, that's fine, it's okay, do it, go for it. So, this is from a book called Men and Insects. A book called what? Can I ask you to shut that door? I was going to, please. Uh, we have visitors in the opposite room. Say the name of the book again. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I did say that. It's called The Secret Life of Bees. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Yes. So, I had previously written um, her her other book, which was nonfiction, and um, it, she was raised in the South to uh, an evangelical minister. And she, she had, this is what uh, is in her first book, which is called The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. All her life long until she was about 21, she felt, where is my place? Where is a woman's place in all of this? Where do I go? Where are my needs met by this religion I'm being raised in? And that started her on a lifelong search to find a way that her femininity could fit into her spiritual beliefs. It was very important to her. And out of that original book, this emerged as a book of fiction. So, The Secret Life of Bees, I also love the title. Yes. Uh, titles are hard, they're very difficult. Um, 
And it's part of what takes us into why we pick up the book. Chapter 1. At night, I would lie in bed and watch the show. I'm going to read that first line over. Yeah. At night, I would lie in bed and watch the show. How bees squeeze through the cracks of my bedroom wall and flew circles around the room, making that propeller sound. A high pitch zzz that hummed along my skin. I watched their wings shining like bits of chrome in the dark and felt the longing build in my chest. The way those bees flew, not even looking for a flower, just flying for the feel of the wind, split my heart down its seam. During the day, I heard them tunneling through the walls of my bedroom, sounding like a radio tuned to static. In the next room, I imagined them in there turning the walls into honeycombs. With honey seeping out for me to taste. The bees came that summer of 1964, the summer I turned 14. And my life went spitting off into a whole new orbit, and I mean whole new orbit. Looking back on it now, I want to say the bees were sent to me. I want to say they showed up like the angel Gabriel appearing to the Virgin Mary, setting events in motion I could never have guessed. I know it is presumptuous to compare my small life to hers, but I have reason to believe she wouldn't mind. I will get to that. Right now, it's enough to say that despite everything that happened that summer, I remain tender toward bees. So any feedback before I start asking questions? I love the similes that she had in there. I don't know exactly what they were, but can you tell me. us, well, I'm sure everybody knows what similes are, but would you mind giving a definition? A definite simile? Mm -hmm. It's something else which, uh, by description, uh, helps define the characteristics that you're trying to say. To That's a good definition. Yeah. It's something that is so like to almost be Yes. The thing we're describing. Anything else that pops out for people? You were saying about the writing? It was, it was breathtaking. I mean, you, you could really visualize uh, what this person was doing and, and calling it, it. For her, it was a show. For some people, it would have been terrifying. For most people. Yeah. Maybe 98% people, they do not want to hear no. bees coming into their room no. out of the cracks in the night. No. How about you? It made me think that she had a very creative imagination because my my response would have been totally different from that. And so, yes. uh, the the way that um, that she interpreted the action of the bees, 
right. uh, you know, was to me something um, uh, special. Um, and, uh, and the way she put it together, the way she tied it uh, together. Um, Good. So, again, we're going to talk about clues that lead us to the story. Mm -hmm. And on most successful first pages, there will be clues always, if we read deeply enough. So, reading deeply enough, by that I mean we succumb to what we read. We give ourselves fully to the reading, and we don't hold back. For a lot of us, this is scary because we're afraid we might be changed by what we read, or we might be affected, perhaps adversely, by what we read, or we might be made to feel more deeply than we are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So there, for most of us in our reading, there's an initial tightening or a holding back before we let go and give in to a story with this kind of power. So let's talk about the clues to this story. Where did the bees come from? In the wall. They came specifically from cracks. Our first clue, cracks. What kind of a house is it? It's gotta be a wooden house, I would think. Yes. Who has cracks in their home, in the walls, in all the walls? <laughs> Poor people. Yeah. Oh. People with no money. Yeah. Why should she enjoy the bees? When most people would have been frightened. It sounds like, to me, an otherness. An uh, otherness? Uh, uh, an otherworldliness. Correct. My guess is that nothing of interest, stimulation, or beauty comes along into this child's life very often so that she has to make her own beauty, a task that many children have to experience and learn to get good at it and often become writers from doing so. So, also, she's in the dark. She's in what? She's in the dark. It's night. Oh, yes. That's At night, night, I would lie in bed and watch the show. And we can't see very well in the dark. No. Right? So part of her seeing the bees is, as somebody pointed Creative. out, her imagination, yeah. her level of... Yeah of um, making up her own stories already at the age of 14. Um, the amazing term propeller for the circling of the bee's wings, something I never thought about, but it will always stick with me. Um, and then this goes on during the day, so what are we thinking about? She's in her bedroom at night, obviously sleeping. Why would she be in her bedroom in the day? Hmm. It, her, it's her uh, place. It's, it's her, her refuge. Yes. It's where she goes, this crumbling room. And she's there after school, perhaps, being friendly with the bees who by now are making honeycombs. Her imagination has, has, has built itself up and is getting uh, coming in at uh, even higher level of imagination and that she can envision in her mind the honeycombs in the walls. And, the, and the, the perhaps dearest thing in all of this, if I can say my own piece, is that the honey is seeping out sweetness is seeping out. So she's making of what we're already suspecting, a difficult life. She's putting her own beauty and sweetness in her own life. 
Then there's this aspect of her turning 14 in 1964. I'm sure everyone in a flash can go back to the age of 14. And what did we all feel that the writer feels? This discontent, this wondering, this loneliness. And I think this is probably all around the same age we started writing. Because how can you tell that there are bees in your walls building honeycombs? Really, who would you go to and tell that to, right? So this is another book that won my first page test. Another book with uh, the first page having clues that lead to the rest of the story. Does anyone want to make any other comment about this first page? No, I read the book and I loved it. I, I you I have read the book. I haven't read the book and I, and I want to read the book. And the way that, that it was presented, it does. It just it draws you in, and you want to know someone who can can see all of these things with bees. It's like being in another world. Now, the family I grew up in, if I can have a personal note here, um, they did not like me to have an imagination. They did not like when I came up with ideas like this, and they were very uh, uh, angry about the whole thing. So I was teased all through my childhood and called um, Mrs. Mature and Mrs. Thinker and things like that all my life. But somehow I couldn't give my bad habit up. And um, so I think we're... Um, we're ready to move on now to our second part of the first period, and that is, um, this is, oh, here we are. We're gonna talk about observation. When we talked in the talk I gave, we, I mentioned one of the most vital traits for any writer is the trait of observation. And observation um, is really a giant word because observation for a writer means what he takes into himself from the great world outside, from the cosmos, from things he learns about in science, if he's interested in the physical world, if he's interested in animals, history, all of that great outer world that seems without end. That's his outward observation, and his observation for those things is very keen. Um, then there is inward observation, and that is also broad, wide, and deep. So where does inward observation come from? I like to think of it as coming from something I call, and people have heard of this solar plexus. I believe that most creative writing, uh, and even contributing to non-creative writing, is something we keep just about here inside our bodies, which is like a dense, densely put together filing chest of all the things we have observed of both the outer world and the inner world. What might be some inner world things that would strike you that would remain with us throughout our lives? Something that had passed through us, perhaps like a river. Does anyone have experience with anything like that? Oh my gosh, all the time, um, writing things. That's a good answer. You know, you just, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it calls, I call back everything that I've ever done, every person that I've ever met, all the things that I've seen, the places I've been, all those things go into the, the, the words of a sentence for me, I mean, so. Observation, observation seems to be, I haven't thought about it, but it seems to be really a key ingredient, more important than education. Well, it is education. Well, um, there's a lot of discussion about what makes a person a writer, and um, often it's thought that they are people of enormous intellect, 
And while they do have awe-inspiring intellects, most writers, um, the soul, if I can use that word here, I hope that's all right, of our writing is often buried deep inside of us. And so that's why I want to talk for a minute about inner observation. Um, uh, as we've talked about our experience of being children, we were probably children who noticed a lot of things. Um, mm. uh, we might notice a day our grandmother walks into a room and she doesn't look like grandma, she looks sad. Grandma's never looked sad before. She looks especially sad. And we learn from our parents, perhaps, that her husband, our grandpa, is ill. Uh, we might learn um, from a teacher who was cruel to us in school that um, we begin to have self-doubt about ourselves and what we can achieve and what we can learn as a student in school. We overhear conversations. Writers are notorious at listening to other people's conversations. <laughs> I'm sure all of us have been out to dinner with whoever it is we should be locking, uh, talking to and listening to. But in fact, we are drawn as if by m magnetism toward the table next to us, or perhaps a, t a couple is having a very quiet, very serious argument, or talking about how they went to see uh, the northern mountains, the Himalayas in northern India. And uh, it's unfortunate for the person we happen to be with. But that's our power of inner observation. And then, um, so, so I want to talk about observation next. And for that, I'm going to use a poem. Uh, of all the kinds of writing that exists, Poetry probably asks the most of um, um, probably asks the most of the writer as far as observation. This is my signed book from Galway Canal, who was one of my teachers uh, through many many years. He died just a couple of years ago, oh. and um, I didn't know he died. He did. He lived it to be about 83. Um, I'm surprised you know him because somehow the aura of Galway Canal didn't make it quite over the Rocky Mountains. And he's much more well known in the middle, in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And he lived in New York and Vermont. He taught in New York. Um, so this is a poem from his collected work, Gawi Canal, collected poems. He has many books. Um, but if you ever want to study him, this is probably a good book to start with because there's bits and pieces of everything that he's done. So uh, tonight we're going to read um, St. Francis and the Sal. So... Obviously, we can hear that his name is Irish, mm -hmm. and we won't be surprised to find out uh, he was raised a Roman Catholic, and so he has some inside info about St. Francis. I wonder if people here know uh, what lots of people call the legend of St. Francis mm -hmm. of Assisi and why he was named a saint. Does anyone know anything about him? I don't know. Tiny okay. bit, but... So St. Francis is followed by truths and legend. I think the legend being the larger part of what we uh, know about St. Francis. St. Francis was uh, and is called the patron of the animals. Mm -hmm. He was a saint who was in love with animals. He lived among the animals in the forest and he took the vow of poverty, and he wore um, a long brown robe tied with a rope, and he eschewed all materialism and lived in caves in the woods and fed the animals. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the legend is that he uh, learned to speak to the animals in a way that they could listen. So these are uh, wonderful things to think about 
And for myself, it doesn't really matter whether they're true or not. Um, I'm just happy there's a saint who loved animals and that the animals loved him. So let's say he has the inside scoop about St. Francis. St. Francis in the sow, everyone knows what a sow is, right? Very large pig, most of the time referred to by one pig who has just given birth. So, St. Francis in the sow, the bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary, excuse me, to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and tell it in words and touch it is lovely until it flowers again from within of, of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and touch blessings of the earth on the sow. And on the sow and the sow began remembering, began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of her tail. Hmm. To the spiritual curl of her tail. From the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through the great broken heart to the sheer blue milk and dreaminess of the 14 miles sucking and blowing beneath them, the long, perfect loveliness of Sal. observation. Sounds like a lover of animals wrote the poem. Exactly. <laughs> what a gift to be able to see something like that, I mean, and something like a sow, and turn it into something so beautiful and, and, and magical and spiritual. Charles, what springs to mind? <clears throat> I'm aware when I'm listening to you, I'm, I lose too many words, so I'm going to move over next to you. Fine. Yeah. Right here. And we'll read the poem again, but more quickly, if you don't mind. Because I don't want you to miss it. We won't have a good talk if you miss it. And we'll still feel close to you. Yes. I'm going to lean your way this time, Charles. St. Francis and the Sow. Hearing okay? Yes. The bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on the brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely, until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. 
as St. Francis put his hand on the creased brow, forehead, I'm sorry, of the sow and told her in words and in touch blessings of earth on the sow. And the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail. From the hard spininess spiked out through the spine down to the great broken heart to the sheer blue milken dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the fourteen teeth into the fourteen mouths sucking and blowing beneath them the long perfect loveliness of Sal. I wonder why he picked the Sal. Keep going with that. Ask yourself and see if you can come up with an answer. Well, I like the way the poem ended, um, although it wasn't quite the end, but for me it was the end, and that's with the spiritual curl of the tail. It's, it's, <laughs> um, Anyone else? Uh, it, uh, it seems to me that um, in addition to her, the outerness of her, uh, the outerness, there was an innerness um, with her function as mother, um, her, how she uh, was in the world, in the slop. Uh, there, just, there was an inner for me and, and seeing into. And where do we first get an idea of this? In the book. Everything flowers from within okay. of self-blessing. Mm. Now, this was written probably in the 80s. And remember at that time we were learning about feminism, we were learning about self-affirmation, we were learning to stand up for ourselves. It was new in our society for us. And I think it's a, it's a timely poem for that time. Um, but he's saying that some people have to be helped along, that they lose their sense of goodness or beauty or growth or flowering. They get lost along the way and they fall backwards. And so what the saint is going to bless as he blesses the snout he put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her, but not just in words, what else? Touch. touch. Human touch. Human touch, after all, in so many ways, is what makes us come alive. From the very beginning, when we're taken from the womb, throughout our lives, when our head is placed on our pillow to die. Human touch is the thing that makes us truly alive. And this is what St. Francis could impart to the sow who had perhaps in her urgency to care for her little ones might have forgotten all about herself as an individual. Wow. So she blooms again and he offers her that chance. So this is what I call poems of observation. How deeply we need to look at the world. Take a look. Take a look again. Take a look. When you write it down, what you've observed, read it out loud. Always read it out loud to yourself and see if you have, in fact, observed it as deeply as you can. It is only through deep observation that the best writing exists. 
We'll have one more on observation, and then we'll take our break. Could you say, uh, you said read it aloud to see what? Read it out loud because I, I guess I didn't give a reason for that. When you read your work out loud, you will hear a number of things. You, you will, excuse my French here, but you will hear yourself bullshitting yourself. Sometimes we write down something and on the page, it looks beautiful. But if when we read it out loud, that doesn't match up. We'll know we're just trying to write something beautiful, not something true, meaningful, or well-observed. Somehow the reading brings that out of what we write. So this is a short piece. It's from a very old book. You can see my books are very old, most of them um, falling apart. Um, this is a book I... Um, by a famous English author who wrote mostly for children and young adults, uh, Kenneth Graham. And he's written other books. I haven't read any other book but this, but I read this to both of my children all through their growing up years. Mm -hmm. But I read it many times for myself. And strange as it will seem to you, for me, this is my favorite book in the English language. And I can't, I don't exactly know why. Um, this book involves something we call anthropomorphism. Are people familiar with that word? Mm -hmm. Are you, Charles, familiar with the word anthropomorphism? I'm sorry? Anthropomorphism. Yes. Yes, you don't know why, too. Okay, so that's, so that's what he's doing here. And we think, well, why would I be interested in that? So... Let's read the first page and see. The Wind in the Willows, Chapter 1, The River Bank. The mole, which he capitalizes, that's important. The mole had been working very hard all morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs with a brush and a pail of whitewash till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him penetrating even his dark lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder then that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor and said, Father! Oh, blow, and also hang spring cleaning. <laughs> you can almost hear the English accent. Hang spring cleaning. And bolted out of his house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously, sorry, and he made for the steep little tunnel which answered, in his case, to the graveled carriage drive owned by animals whose residents are nearer to the sun and air. Observations. What do we know about moles? They live in the ground. But? And they come out. I think they dig backwards. 
That's a good observation. That's not here in the book. But uh, I don't know about that. I'll just, I'll, I will look it up. And they're always cleaning their, their abode? Would, no, would they're not be? really. This is the beginning of the anthropomorphism. Yeah. When yeah. he's making them into yeah. people. Why should anyone do that? I'm always scared of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> but, um, but do moles see, or are they blind? I think, I think they're right. blind. They're blind. Yeah. They're blind. That is so important in this page, and so part of the wonderfulness of um, Kenneth Graham. Because he can smell spring, and naturally, like uh, blind people, mm -hmm. His scent, his power of scent, is very strong. So no one needs to yell down his tunnel and tell him it's spring. He can smell the air above him. And the wonderfulness of this first page is the air going around him and beneath him. Who of us would ever claim to smell the air beneath us? That's the powers of his scent. And my favorite part of this page Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him penetrating even his dark and lowly little house house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. We have talked forever, haven't we, all our lives, about the nostalgia we feel in spring. It hits a nerve in us. It takes us back to other springs. It takes us back to other beginnings. When we see the trees bloom, when we see the grass grow, and we have faith once again, that things begin and start over. It's uplifting, but at the same time, there's something sad because it is another spring, and there were very many springs before that. So, all right, uh, we've all talked a little bit, and I've talked too much, and so we'll refresh ourselves. Um, if someone could help me bring a couple bottles of soda.